Okay, so just to start, guys, just a, a quick review um, of our Blanquist Health Benefit, just for anyone who isn't familiar with it. Um, the, the, sorry, I was getting distracted by my screen, making sure I'm not muted here. So the, um, our benefit is help, we can offer help with any of your life challenges. The, the services we provide are free to you. Uh, your employers actually pay us for us to provide service to you. So it's a really great resource to utilize. 100% confidential, like any counseling. Um, we aren't going to be sharing any information um, that you share with us with your employer or um, unless you know, for some reason you needed us to do some kind of communication with them with you. So it's 100% confidential. Um, we offer, especially valuable right now with the, the uh, with COVID, we do offer, but we offer year round as well. We offer phone or video counseling um, as, as this, as we're opening back up and things are kind of easing down with the <clears throat> social distancing, we'll, we will be offering in person again. We just uh, don't know exactly when that will be. The great thing about uh, employee assistance is also just the ease of how to access it. Sometimes it's difficult to find a counselor, to look them up, to figure out your insurance. You don't have to worry about any of that with us. If, you, um, if your pro provider, uh, or excuse me, if your employer provides this as a service, then you just call us directly and we can get you in. Uh, we also offer a 24 seven crisis line. Um, so that means that we have a therapist who's on call um, 24 seven. So if there is, again, if there's a crisis, then you can reach out to us um, and we can try to help connect you with, with resources that you may need. Our hours, our office hours, during the week, 9 uh, a.m. to 9 p.m., we do offer counseling in the evenings. Uh, Saturdays, I believe it's 9 to 3 p.m. We are closed on Sundays. So that's another really great benefit is that sometimes with um, counselors, you wouldn't necessarily have to take time off work. Sometimes that's a problem with, with other counseling options. So, um, so we're going to get right into the topic. Uh, we're going to be, we're talking today about how to foster happiness um, and during all the things that are going on for us. So in addition to just talking about right now with the challenges that we're facing with COVID, I think it's really helpful to have some information on research that pertains to just happiness in general. And there's, a, there's um, I'm taking a lot of the information today. Um, some of the information I've, been, I've taken is actually from a, a, um, a PhD. His name is Hank Smith, and he has a um, a really, he just does a lot of work on how on on the hap on happiness, and he's referenced a lot of um, resources from um, the uh, Dr. Seligman, who's the creator of positive psychology. If you've ever heard of that, um, so there's as well as some other several other research studies, and so what we're talking about is not just kind of you know a light suggestion. It's actually um, strategies, skills information that are, are evidence-based, um, which is, is really helpful. So just to start with this slide, um, this Hank Smith says that there are two kinds of happiness. He said there's the kind of happiness that, or the kind that happens to you, and the kind that happens inside of you. Now the key is that we can only be, have experienced true happiness or more enduring, lasting happiness beyond just kind of instant pleasure or gratification. We can only experience happiness if we have that second kind of happiness. So that means that there are some things that um, what research shows and, and what, uh, what we, I think, observe in our own lives that there are some things that, ha that occur inside of us. There's some habits that we, um, can practice and there's some things we can be aware of that help us to foster ha happiness habits. So that's actually really significant. Um, this kind of leads us into a concept of, of, the, of our locus of control. So kind of where what he was, what Dr. Smith was talking about with, it, sometimes it's easy to, to, for all of us, to feel that our, the locus of control, the, 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 the thing that controls our happiness level or personal peace or any of that is outside of us. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about how circumstances and environment affect us. But even with that, there is still, it's still true that 
if our locus of control, if our perception of our happiness is about all the things that are happening to us, um, or and it stays on that focus, um, we're not likely to experience a lot of happiness in our lives. Um, one of the key factors of depression is that there's hopelessness and, and helplessness associated with that. And there's nothing worse than feeling like we have no ability to affect our outcome. We have no ability to affect, to, to influence our, our lives. So again, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that happen to us that can affect us um, in, in various ways, but if we can really try to focus our locus of control internally, then we're focusing on, we will accomplish, we will um, find, we'll manifest the things and we'll grow the things that we focus on, that we're looking for. So if I can say, well, you know, I do have influence in my life. Um, what are my resources? And not only focus on the challenges that we have, what are um, the, the my internal resources, what are the supports outside of myself? So that focus on, on our locus of control is especially important. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about stress and how that pertains to our levels of happiness. There are two kinds of stress. There's what is referred to as eustress, and then there's what is referred to as distress. So what is the difference? Our perception. Our perception of a stressor is actually what mostly determines if we are feeling distress or eustress. So, if I perceive something that's difficult as a challenge rather than an obstacle that impedes me from being able to be happy, that's where the key, the key lies. Um, again, it doesn't mean that we don't have habits that we practice, that we don't reach out, reach out to uh, resources, uh, connect. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of those things, but that, what is especially significant and the difference between eustress and distress is also that eustress is usually more of a temporary it's not a constant chronic stress that's more when we're in uh, um you know some of uh, some kind of a distress uh, and and so then there are things that we want to do and working with that we've got some other really great webinar recordings on managing stress and anxiety and so the things we're talking about here today we're talking about happiness in general, but we also want to acknowledge and be aware that there are also sometimes other factors that impact people. So we're not, we're not minimizing conditions where somebody may be experiencing an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder or something of that nature. But even in those situations, this information does apply. Okay, so during COVID, um, we had an excellent, one of the very first webinars that, that we offered, um, uh, one of our therapists, Justin, uh, presented a, on <clears throat> how to manage stress and anxiety during COVID-19. If I think it's worth everybody taking the time to watch that. He also references some other, um, a, a man named Sean Accor, who has a book called The Happiness Advantage, but he talks really a lot in detail about just specifically to ways of managing our stress and our anxiety and the things that we can do during the, the, the situation that we're in with COVID. Things are starting to ease up in a lot of ways, and so we're able to reconnect more and um, hopefully you know, there's still a lot of, of challenges associated with it, but that would definitely be a great uh, very much worth your time to watch that webinar as well. So this is actually taken from his webinar and it was just just kind of a very basic ways to manage our stress and our anxiety. So I think you've probably heard this a ton by this point. Taking breaks from watching, reading, listening to news stories, including social media. Right now social media has been, um, has been and, and technology are, have been such a great asset for us. Um, it's allowed us to continue with work in various ways. It's allowed us to connect with people who we can't connect with in person. So we're not undermining the importance of those things. However, just like when, for those of you who were alive during 9-11, um, I remember hearing uh, various uh, uh, research coming out about how watching the videos over and over of the planes hitting the towers 
it significantly increased people's anxiety, significantly increased um, levels of depression. Our brain doesn't necessarily always know in terms of the stress hormones and the different things that are produced and the, it, the biological symptoms that are associated with stress doesn't necessarily know the difference of when we're recalling something, especially when we are over and over exposing ourselves. We can, um, as with technology, for example, that can be incredibly stressful for us. And that makes it difficult for us to, ex to experience um, happiness and just a sense of well being. So the other just really kind of basic things, we're gonna talk a little more about some of this stuff as well, is taking care of our bodies, breathing, stretching, meditation. A lot of the time we think that the simple things are just too simple, that it wouldn't work and we look for bigger answers. However, a good part of the time, those simple things have a lot more influence than over time and just than trying to take some big, huge, or look for some big, huge solution. Um, it's those little things that we do to take care of ourselves. Our bodies, our minds, our emotions are all um, interconnected. They're inseparable. Trying to eat healthy, well-balanced meals. Again, we're talking moderation. We're not, but giving our brains and our bodies what they need to function well. Exercising regularly. I anybody who knows me knows that when I'm talking about exercising, I really encourage people to think of it as joyful movement. So something, you know, if, if someone, and I remember it at various times in my life, people saying, well, you know, exercise really helps with anxiety or exercise really helps with these different situations. And in my mind for so long, I had kind of this image of step aerobics or different kinds of things that we did, or, you know, the mile run from junior high and the things that I didn't necessarily associate as pleasant at all. I, I kind of thought, well, that's actually adding more stress. But when I started to realize, wow, there's huge benefits. There's a lot of research that, that supports this. There's huge benefits of just in walking and moving our bodies. If we can 30 minutes a day, if, you know, anything that we do is going to help. Um, so thinking in terms of joyful movement, if you like to dance, it, we can, um, incorporate movement with um, out projects in our home or gardening or but getting that daily movement in um, really does make a difference in terms of our brains our bodies um, so there's more information we're going to talk about with that the other getting plenty of sleep in general seven to nine hours and, and there's a lot of people who say well I can get by with five hours and and there's a lot of people who do or four hours research though does consistently show us that our bodies in terms of um, avoiding long-term effects associated with disease, um, ability to regulate our emotions, which is a huge one that sometimes we don't think about, um, that the more that we focus on trying to get somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep dramatically increases our ability to, to cope. Um, and and, and uh, during our sleep, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that's when our body heals. Um, and, and we get some peace from all the, in our brain as well, from all of the constant functioning. So the other kind of an obvious, avoid alcohol, drugs, or any kind of behaviors that are more about what would be, we would refer to as self-medicating. There's a difference in self-care and in nurturing ourselves and in trying to medicate. With self-medicating, it's more a matter of, of avoidance instead of, um, presence. I, when I talk with people about the difference between distraction and avoidance, distraction can be a really healthy, healthy coping skill. In our mind though, we know it's like a round trip ticket. We're going to come, we're using the distraction to help kind of feed ourselves, feed our wellness or give us a, a, a rest, um, remove some stress. But we know we're going to come back to when we're maybe in a better state of mind or we're feeling better physically or if, if it's with a conflict with somebody else where things, people are kind of more calmed down. And so that's, you know, distraction can be great. The di again, the difference is with avoidance, it's more of a one trip ticket. Like I'm just going to numb out from this and and I'm not going to address this, which doesn't work. And that's the challenge with alcohol, drugs, and when we're using food in ways that um, are, are not necessarily helping us to actually rejuvenate and then come back around to what are some things I can do for, for greater coping? What resources and assets can I identify? Okay. So during this period, there's, again, we've talked a little bit about perception. 
we're not going to we're not minimizing the fact that for a lot of people there's loss of work there's certainly social isolation missing significant events um we can acknowledge those things and we can be aware of those things what is helpful for us then is to say okay well what assets what resources do i have to help me cope with these things and a huge one is how can how can i maintain connection um, are, are there new experiences that I can create from this? Can I look for positive things about this? Um, for me, and I've actually talked to other counselor, another counselor the other day, she was talking, she said, you know, I was really getting a, a bit burned out. And so I can see how kind of things slowing down has actually helped me to focus a little more on my wellness, which um, I can definitely relate to. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, wow, I'm spending a lot more time with my family. Um, I've heard other people say, um, you know, I, I picked up some new interests or some new hobbies. And so we're not ignoring the fact that there are challenges, but the things within our locus of control are what are the thing, what are my assets and starting to really, again, to look and focus on what we have and what we can do and create. So I would really encourage all of us to spend some time thinking about well, what do I want from this time? What do I want? Um, and, and then what are my resources and writing it down. There's a lot of power that comes from writing things down instead of all the things that circle around in our minds. Um, again, it seems so simple, but it's huge. Okay. So there was a man, there's a man named Dr. Seligman, and again, he is the uh, father of positive psychology. And there was a study that was taken place in 1978. And it was a really significant, it's kind of, it, um, what? see 40 years ago however still really significant findings because what they did essentially is they had two groups of people they had one group of people who had just won the lottery which you know hey i'm not going to say I, that wouldn't bring some some happiness or wouldn't op potentially open some doors or couldn't be a a, a great asset um but this in this study is really interesting so they had this group of people who had just won a lottery and then they had a group of people who had just become paraplegic so they lost the, the use of their legs really significant life-changing event they measured the levels of happiness with both of these groups in, in immediately following these things these these events and then they measured their levels of happiness using that same tool again a year later and i think most of us would expect that the people who had won the lottery would still be happier. Um, but what they found is that there was actually the exact same happiness level one year after that event. So when we hear circumstances do not define our happiness, this is a really good example about that. That doesn't mean circumstances don't, may not affect our happiness, but they do not define it. A happiness really does originate in our mind. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of the brain, but there's a frontal portion of our brain, this frontal lobe, and that's the part of our brains as human beings. We are the only, only creatures we're aware of that can not only have thoughts, but we can actually think about our thoughts. And we can notice, we're going to talk a little bit later about um, distorted thinking and how if we recognize, well, my thinking is kind of distorted right now. And, and again, it's all about observing and with compassion. It's not about judging ourselves, but observing, oh, you know, maybe I wonder, maybe there's a different way I could look at this. And maybe that might affect how I feel about this. It might affect then my, my efforts or my um, belief about what kind of happiness I can experience or wellness. So, um, just that kind of basic awareness that that frontal portion of our brain actually allows us to not only have certain thoughts but to observe our thoughts and our thought processes that's really significant we're the only uh, creature on earth that has that capacity as far as we're aware so uh there's uh, some more information from dr Sir, uh, dr seligman he talks about how 50 percent so in regard to where our happiness originates, 50% is associated with genetic tendencies, okay? So that means that our brain structure, um, we have tendencies, there are some people who tend to be more 
easygoing, more happy-go-lucky. There, there's something in our brain, this is just a very basic, but we have something called neurotransmitters. And they, our brain produces these neurotransmitters, um, some of them dopamine, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine. We're all pretty probably fairly familiar with serotonin. It's kind of just the, uh, the neurotransmitter that um, gives us a sense of just kind of well-being. Okay, dopamine is more associated with pleasure. Um, so again, when we're talking about people maybe who, um, who are really easily, just naturally tend to be a little more easygoing, fairly safe to realize that those people probably have some, some good levels of serotonin and dopamine, right? Um, so does that mean that if I don't have that same genetic tendency that I can't experience wellness that I can't experience pleasure. No, it doesn't. It just means I'm going to, I'm going to maybe need to focus a little more on the intentional activities that I can do. Um, so the significance about this slide though, is that if you'll notice 10% of our happiness actually originates from our circumstances. It's, it's kind of opposite of what I would have thought before learning about some of these things that I, you know, that our, our circumstances define our happiness levels. And it's just, that's just not true. It's just not what research shows. Do, do our, does our environment affect us? Does circumstances have an effect? Of course they do. But this is empowering in terms of giving us an idea of, of looking at various uh, factors that can help us in establishing happiness habits for intentional habits for happiness and establishing taking a look at our environment where we might need to make adjustments in our environment and also um, kind of working with our uh, just like we work with our biology working with that biology of of and the, of our brain and um, that it, it can have significant impacts so dr seligman also said that or we found from research, he said the happiest people are those people who have found their specific gifts and who use those gifts in a cause greater than themselves. He called it getting into flow. So I remember hearing about this 20 years ago as a young college student and the concept of flow. And as we talked about it, it was talking about um, identifying kind of some of our unique abilities. And when we are engaging in and um, utilizing some of those unique abilities, that's what is referred to as kind of the flow. There are things that are easier or that come more naturally to each of us. And sometimes it's easy to make comparisons and think, well, why aren't I more like that? Or why aren't I more like this? Or, you know, I'd, I'd really like to be more, um, I don't know, more technically, uh, have more of a technical aptitude or techno with toward technology. I can work on that. I can grow that. But kind of part of what flows more for me is um, understanding people and kind of a sense of in intuition there. Um, and so recognizing different things that about ourselves, observing what are some of the things that I'm really good at? What are some of the things that I don't necessarily have to work as hard at? And how can I use those things right now? And then the key of what um there's a man named rick warren you can see in this picture the only really happy people are those who have learned how to serve so the kick the key here is not only knowing our unique abilities but contributing them to a greater cause is a significant factor in experiencing happiness okay this is just a, a one of my absolute favorite quotes uh, victor frankl is a man who lived in a, a nazi concentration camp and I can't imagine, you know, when I hear, he has a book called Man's Search for, for uh, Meaning. And, you know, when, when somebody who experienced some of those atrocities is talking about how we can focus on happiness, I'm, I'm very inclined to listen because he's definitely had circumstances that I can't imagine. So he said this, he said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. So the more we focus on our why, on what, what matters to us, on our core values, on our unique abilities, on um, what, what brings us meaning in our lives, that helps us 
with how to proceed amid challenges or how to pursue the things that, that we desire. And he also said, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. It's again, significant. Every day I, I ask myself, um, so what am I going to do today that I'm going to experience purpose and, and uh, that feels meaningful to me, that I'm going to experience some connection. We know we're hide, hardwired. Our brains are designed to need connection um, and to experience joy, to try to feed some of my joy. Um, because if I can have that in every day, I'm not holding my breath until the weekend. I'm not holding my breath until this other thing happens, or you know, I just need to buckle down and just, um, you know, life is just life is hard, and that's just how it is. It is hard, but there is also we also can experience joy in life, and sometimes it's just those little pieces of joy that help us get through the more difficult times. And, it, and then the challenges aren't as intense. So I'd encourage all of you as well to think about at the beginning of each day, it doesn't have to be complicated. What can I do today that, I, that help, can help me experience purpose? A why, a why for what I'm doing um, that can help me connect to other people. There's a study of babies in Russia um, and, or I believe it was Russia, it was somewhere in the Eastern Bloc. And, a lot of they we don't have orphanages here anymore our, our um, systems are different but it, they, they still do have orphanages in other countries and these babies there were so many of these babies in this orphanage compared to how many staff they had um, that they had to kind of uh, regulate how often the babies were held essentially so they because they they didn't they couldn't keep up and they didn't want them to get too used to being held. Well, we know that in those early years, that's where by being touched, by, you know, in crying, by having somebody respond to us, we learned that the world is a place that will respond to us. We learned that there are other people, that somebody will come to us. That's, it's where we form kind of basic attachment. These babies, what they found is that many of these babies who were not being held, were not being touched on a regular basis, weren't, you know, when they would cry, wouldn't have somebody respond to that, that they would actually turn to the wall and die. That's a powerful example of the importance of connection. Um, every human being needs it, even introverts, right? So we need some, some sort of connection, maybe different levels of connection are, are um, but, connection with other people with uh with the, with the something bigger than ourselves um and then again feeding our joy so that's very significant and i'd encourage you to kind of take a look at that this is just a basic diagram about our brains so th the importance of this diagram is it kind of introduces us to the fact that there we encounter some, some kind of stimulating event so let's say COVID-19, that event um, impacts, is, impacts all of us to different degrees. Then what happens is up in this prefrontal portion of our brain, that's where our perception of the event, our perception of what's going on. Can I cope with this? Can, um, do I have resources? What are my, the, you know, what are, what are we perceiving, observing, judging? And then that leads directly into the emotions that we produce. So this prefrontal portion of our brain communicates with the limbic portion of our brain. The limbic portion is where we, where emotions generate. Okay. There's a part of our brain called the amygdala. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the primitive brain. That's a specific part of the limbic system, piece of the brain where fear and anxiety generate okay everybody experiences fear and anxiety um and something that's really important to kind of keep in mind is that our emotions actually communicate things to us about ourselves and sometimes communicate things about us to other people as well so our goal is never going to be to eliminate any fearing and anxiety that's like it's kind of like having a goal of perfectionism which leads to continual disappointment 
our goal is to understand and recognize when when we're feeling fear and anxiety or and other emotions as well and to learn skills that can help us to balance that with our ability to observe our thoughts that we talked about earlier we can observe our thoughts and it's possible actually the practice of mindfulness we hear a lot about that the practice of mindfulness basically says that it's possible to observe feelings thoughts bodily sensations and to not judge them i was diagnosed with anxiety when i was 21 and so when I first started learning about this, I remember thinking that's, that's ridiculous. You've obviously never had this person, whoever created this or has never had anxiety because there's no way for me to observe that I'm feeling anxious without judging that as a negative. However, the more I, am, I have been able to focus on observing that I'm feeling anxiety and not getting stuck in the anxiety or the fear, the more impact I have on what I can do to potentially affect those emotions. Okay. Again, that's the benefit of this prefrontal cortex that we have. So with mindfulness, that helps us to create these pathways where um, it's our thinking patterns are stronger in terms of, wow, I'm, I'm feeling really, I'm feeling in fear. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm feeling really sad. I'm feeling um, really anxious. Uh, I'm, f I'm really happy being able to observe that and actually impact how those emotions intensify or maybe um, become less intense. Um, Dr. Dan Siegel talks about, this is a really great model for explaining emotion to children. Um, he basically uses kind of this, if this our, our hand as an example of what the brain, um, a very simple example of how the brain works. And he talks about, you know, so our arm maybe being the brain stem, um, this portion of our brain being the limbic portion where emotions generate, this would be the amygdala, okay, where all the fear and the anxiety generate. And then this, my fingers would be the prefrontal portion of our brain. So when we are in intense emotion, what can happen is it's kind of like our lid flips. We flip our lid. Um, we're, we're only in whatever emotion's going on, whether it's fear and anxiety or whether it's intense, you know, happiness or, or pleasure or whatever's going on. But if with mindfulness, it helps us to re-engage that prefrontal portion of our brain so that we can have some awareness. And as we have that awareness, we that's what is referred to in dbt which is dialectical behavior therapy as wise mind that's the best place that we can be is trying to be aware and utilizing the benefits of emotion okay so that's just something that you know if you're working with somebody who is really um agitated or is um maybe you know I don't know, maybe super excited, but not thinking through consequences of choices or whatever it may be. We can kind of, in terms of thinking for ourselves or maybe observing somebody who we have responsibility in, in trying to kind of guide or direct, you know, have you, is, has, what can, would you need to do to try to help bring that lid down, to try to reincorporate some of the, the cognitive processes that the, um, in the prefrontal cortex, okay? So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith, I think Smith, I, um, and I believe that some of this is taken from Dr. Seligman, identified 10 intentional happiness habits. And this is, basic, this, is, this is just based off of various research that's kind of consistently come back um, in, in observing people. And so the very first one he, he talked about is being around people who are happy. Now, we talked about how our circumstances don't define our happiness. They can affect it. We do know that this, so there are sometimes there, you know, we have people in our lives who maybe aren't, don't tend to be as positive or happy. We're not talking about eliminating those people from our lives. There, there may be a need for some boundaries. Um, 
to be able to try to figure out well, what part of this is my responsibility. Can I, am I responsible for somebody else's happiness? Um, how can I have empathy, but also keep my wellness as a, as kind of my primary work and my focus. However, we know in terms of the, the people we associate with that has a massive effect on our happiness levels. Um, so we want to look at adding more people who are happy into our lives or people who are self-aware into our lives. Um, so being realistic about this, but just knowing, you know, it's kind of similar to what am I exposing myself to in social media? What am I exposing myself in, in media in general? Um, I, I regulate the kind of news and the frequency of the news that I watch because it impacts it impacts my thinking, it impacts my, um, my emotion. So it's kind of a similar thing. If there are people, we all have people who are a little more challenging in our lives, we're not talking about eliminating you know, people in our families or things like that, but we're talking about having an awareness of, wow, you know, um, I need to, I want to also make sure I'm connecting with people who behave the way that I would like to behave, who, seem to have levels of happiness and wellness that I would like to have and notice what they do and it, give ourselves that influence um, is significant. He also talked about spending on other people. He was talking about money. So he we want to be careful here to talk about, we're not talking about spending beyond our means. We're not talking about excessive, um, you know, excessive gifts and things of that nature. But there, there's significance in, and I think not only money, but also our means. Again, this comes back to the service and the connection. It's well established that once an individual is above the poverty level and has enough for their basic needs, the amount of money that they make is actually extremely insignificant in terms of levels of happiness. Um, it's just not true. The more money I have, the happier I am. It, it, not real happiness, not the real enduring wellness and sense of happiness that we're talking about. Okay. So having an awareness of, you know, what am I doing to use my resources to help other people? Significant again, and we hear over and over cutting down on screen time too much screen time, whether it's our phones, whether it's the television, uh, the computer, too much screen time consistently comes back showing as having damaging effects on our brain structure and the functions of our brain. It's related to disrupted sleep, to overloaded sensory. You know, when I, I, I am somebody who, I, when I get a ton of texts um, from a lot of different people, it's, um, I, I, I start to get agitated. I start to, you know, kind of feel anxious or like I can't keep up with all this or I can't focus. And so it's interesting to me. It doesn't come as any surprise. I was in a training. They were talking about how um, teenagers are, are coming out with significant um, in terms of how their, their brains are developing. Um, the structure's looking very different. If you can imagine for those who are on Snapchat and Instagram and Marco Polo and um, Facebook and I mean, just non and then texting and nonstop on the phone, their brains never slowing down. If it, it impacts our ability for awareness as well. Okay. Um, it also impacts let it definitely less it contributes to less physical activity, which we know is directly associated. It limits um, in person connections as well, which is also a benefit. Okay, so the next intentional happiness habits, talking to people in person, taking the time and making the effort to engage eye to eye, happy people emotionally connect in real life. And those emotional connections really feed our brains. Okay, another significant, laughter. Average some studies, one study, kind of an average amount of, uh, of what was observed. Children laugh more than 300 times a day. Adults, they found, were laughing on average 15 times a day. We know that life gets harder, it gets more complicated, we have more responsibilities. However, 
So if we can focus on that, on, on incorporating more laughter, it was ex interesting because um, there was a study that found that the change that uh, laughter creates in your body is so effective that it can actually be classified as an aerobic exercise. We know that with ex aerobic exercise, we produce endorphins. We produce more, sugar. more serotonin, more dopamine, the neurotransmitters. Um, there's a lot of benefits associated with exercise, but I thought that was really significant. There was one um, study referenced from Stanford that talked about how three, let's see, 20 seconds of intense laughter equated to the same benefits of the same aerobic benefits as three minutes of intense rowing, it, uh, which I thought was fascinating. So laughter is really important for a lot of reasons. Another study or another happiness habit is listening to uplifting music. Music has the ability to access portions of our brain, of our memory, to impact us in huge ways. Uh, there was a study where two groups, one group was offered and um, was asked to listen to uplifting music for one hour every day for three months. The other group was offered a one hour massage. I don't know if you've ever gotten a massage, they're, they're pretty great, <laughs> but was offered a one hour massage every day for three months. I'm a fan of massage. <laughs> um, the group that had the highest level of happiness is the one that listened to one hour of uplifting music every day. That is incredible to me. I realize, I'm, and I, there are a lot of times when I'll notice, well, I'm not listening to as much music and, and definitely the kinds of music and what I'm listening to affects me. Okay, we're gonna continue forward because we're getting a little shorter on time. So happiness habit number seven, exercise and eating a healthy diet. Again, we kind of talked a little bit about this. The significant thing here though, is that it's not about our weight, body shape or size that is the, that they connected with the levels of happiness. It was more related to, you tend to um, produce and, and have access to more vitamin D, um, which is also helps with mood and energy, the endorphins that we produce, the increased neurotransmitters, okay? Number eight, go outside a lot. This is just a picture of our immediate surroundings in Salt Lake. We have incredible mountains. We, there are parks and trees and um, nature actually provides us with energy, intrinsic worth and vitality. There, I would encourage any of you to do a little bit of research on the effects of nature on our brains and on our, on our nervous system in general. It's pretty, pretty in, in, incredible. Get, again, we already talked about getting enough sleep. Um, for those of us who struggle at times with sleep, we want to look into um, something called sleep hygiene. There, there are suggestions, there are kind of guidelines of things that we can do that literally will contribute to our ability to sleep better, to down, uh, wind down at the end of the day. Some of those things include muscle relaxation. You can look up binaural beats on YouTube. It basically has bilateral stimulation between our right and left brain and how that can relax um, if you want to know if you're sleep deprived, they suggested that you go to bed without an alarm and see when your body wakes up. Is it waking up at the regular time? Um, if it is, then you, you're probably getting sufficient sleep. If not, then you want to look at some ways to try and increase um, more, increase your sleep so that you're getting it to where your body has kind of a, a somewhat consistent sleep and wake cycle. The last one. Tuning into the spiritual. We're not talking about religion. So there's a woman named Brene Brown who's done a lot of research. Um, there's a really excellent book, um, some great TED Talks that she's done. But her most recent book, recent book is called Rising Strong. And there's, um, there's a rising strong as a spiritual practice specifically. She, what she does is she researches um, uh, happiness. And she researches connections. She researches how to live wholeheartedly, what contributes to wellness. She said, without exception, the concept of spirituality emerged from the data as a critical component of resilience and overcoming struggle. Okay. And the way she defines spirituality, she said, it's recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us. And that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. Practicing spirituality brings a sense of perspective 
meaning and purpose to our lives. There we go again. We're hearing that, you know, perspective, which we've already talked about, the meaning and the purpose. Okay. Meditation is one form of, is something that we can practice that links also to, um, to some of the benefits with the spirituality. There was a study from Harvard that was shown that 30 minutes a day actually was shown to reduce the size of that amygdala where the fear and anxiety is generated. Even 10 to 20 minutes a day makes a big difference. It gives us time to um, calm some of that limbic portion of our brain, some of uh, calm our bodies, and to kind of re-engage the frontal portion of our brain. It's a, it can be as simple as an inward focus on our breathing. Um, there are a lot of really great uh, resources, med free meditations on YouTube, apps for your phone. I you know a lot of people will utilize some of these to help to do a meditation during the day at work. And it's, it's just kind of at, at your desk and do just some breathing and kind of some um, uh, uh, guided imagery. Uh, significantly, if, uh, simple but significant and really effective. Okay, so some of the good ones that I've, I've heard of, Simple Habit, Calm, Insight Timer, Brainwave, they offer free guided, med guided meditations and um, that can be really helpful for helping us to kind of understand how to implement some of that practice. Okay, we've talked a little bit about mindfulness, so I'm actually going to kind of skip through this part. Um, but again, it's the intentional observation without judgment. So we're just observing. Um, what's going on with us, okay? The other thing uh, that's really helpful with mindfulness and with breathing is that it helps us with, um, or meditation is that it really gets us focused on our breath. Uh, a meditation coach made the comment, everything rises and falls around the breath. If you'll notice when people are stressed, a lot of times they'll either hold their breath or eventually they'll take in a deep breath. I notice this even just in the stores. If I'm, you know, by a parent whose child is struggling or if somebody's frustrated with a line or I notice it in myself, our bodies intuitively know there's something about our breathing that can help calm that nervous system, um, it can help relax our bodies, can help, help with our, our thoughts, okay? And remembering that our emotions ebb and flow, just trying to observe them like, like, like waves on the beach, okay? That's kind of, again, that concept of not getting attached. Gratitude and happiness. We cannot talk about happiness without talking about gratitude. Science has shown us that if you spend two full minutes focused on a happy thought, your brain actually starts making you happier. This is one of my absolute favorite quotes. I, I discovered this um, about 10 years ago when I was going through a really difficult time. I found it at a, at a um, this little, at a, at a, I think it was like at a, a flea market or something. And, and it hit me so strongly. I actually had it, had it put it up in my home to remember gratitude. This is a woman named Melody Beatty. She said, gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity it turns problems into gifts, failures into success, the unexpected into perfect timing, and mistakes into important events. Gratitude makes sense of our past. It brings peace for today, and it creates a vision for tomorrow. So I'd encourage you to kind of think about that and think about that in your lives and how that can work. There's plenty of research that establishes that if we can, can incorporate some kind of a, a gratitude practice, looking for the things that are going well when we're in st stressful situations, looking for the, the things that are, are, are assets and focusing on that. It affects our, how our brain functions, which affects how our bodies function, um, which affects our behavior, our interactions with the, with our, the world and with um, our perceptions of our experiences. This is a great poem too. We're going to read it from the top down to the bottom, and then we're going to and then we're going to do a little flip. I was at a training, and this was read, and it really stuck out to me too. So today was the absolute worst day ever. I don't try to and don't try to convince me that there's something good in every day, because when you take a closer look, this world is a pretty evil place. Even if some goodness does shine through once in a while, 
Satisfaction and happiness don't last. And it's not true that it's all in the mind and heart because true happiness can be obtained only if one's surroundings are good. It's not true that good exists. I'm sure you can agree that the reality creates my attitude. It's all beyond my control. And you'll never in a million years hear me say that today was a good day. Okay, we're gonna change our perspective here. And we're gonna read it from the bottom up. Today was a good day. And you'll never in a million years hear me say that. It's all beyond my control. My attitude creates the reality. I'm sure you can agree that it's not true that good exists. Only if one's surroundings are good. True happiness can be obtained. Oh, sorry, only if one's surroundings are good. True happiness can be obtained because it's all in the mind and heart. And it's not true that satisfaction and happiness don't last. Some goodness does shine through once in a while, even if this world is a, is a pretty evil place. Because when you take a closer look, there's something good in every day. And don't try to convince me that today was the absolute worst day ever. Our perspective, again, what we tell ourselves, what we're subjected to, what we subject ourselves to, the influences, the, um, what, we, what we pursue, what our intentional habits absolutely impact, create our experience, okay? We're not gonna have time to read through these, but, if you've not ever heard of the concept of thinking patterns. So when we modify how our thoughts work, we can actually change our brains. The importance is that we have to practice these things. So again, it's intentional, but it literally rewires the, the communication that's happening in our brain so that more positive thinking, we recognize more quickly some of the thinking patterns that are, are distorted and that impact us. I remember hearing about these the first time and thinking, I thought this was just me. So I'd encourage you to just look up online. You can find various lists of distorted thinking patterns. Just really quickly, some black and white thinking. It's, it's either all or nothing. There's not a middle ground. Catastrophizing. What does that look like in our lives? What, when we react to disappointment or failure as though it, it's the end of the world. Believing we can read people's minds. Well, they did that. They must be mad at me or they must not like me or I know how they're feeling. Personalizing. Anything that's going on is because of us. Jumping to conclusions without checking the evidence. Um, filtering out the positive. Again, only looking at the things that are a challenge and not ob observing and putting some emphasis on the things that are positives. The word should, I don't like the word should very much. Um, it's we use it way too much. We criticize based on our absolute ideas, either ourselves or other people. They should have done this or I should have done this. If we can try to think about inserting the word could, all of a sudden there's a lot less shame, there's a lot less immediate dire consequence and, and pressure, and it becomes more about getting the creativity and about how something could work better. Perfectionism, one of the leading causes of unhappiness. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. We're looking for progress. We're looking, and that's, that's what defines our success. Labeling, I'm such an idiot. People are so selfish. How does that make us feel? What does that make us feel about the world? Um, and then reasoning only from our emotions that just because we feel a certain way, it indicates the truth about a situation. Mindfulness helps us with that because it reminds us that emotions ebb and flow and that maybe there's something that we're missing. Last thing I wanna share with you, there's an excellent quote. Mr. Rogers, he, um, we all know he has contributed so much to the world and making a better place. He said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. To this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's words and I'm always comforted by realizing that there are still so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. Again, that serves for the connection, that serves for perspective, that serves for maybe looking for ways that we can be of influence and find meaning um, and affect outcomes instead of have ev all of the things around us creating our experience. Um, whoops, went back the wrong way. So that's everything I have that I wanna share with you today. I wanna thank you for joining us. Again, I would encourage everybody to kind of look back at that or request the link to the webinar that Justin did in the beginning. 
of this. He talks about some other things, um, including um, some resources from Shauna Kaur, who does a lot of research on happiness. And so, yeah, let me know if there's any questions. <laughs>